Hello, I'm hematologist oncologist Dr. Tony Talibi. Today we're going to discuss diffuse large B cell lymphoma. I have the pleasure of being with Dr. Ann Moorbacher, Associate Professor of Medicine at the University of Southern California. Thank you for being here. Sure. So Dr. Moorbacher, before we talk about diffuse large B cell lymphoma, what is non-Hodgkin's lymphoma? Well, people ask that question first because they sort of, why isn't it just called Hodgkin's lymphoma, right, which right. just happened to be uh, another type of lymphoma that's less common that was right. named first. But it's a proliferation of lymphocytes of the immune system, most commonly of B lymphocytes, the type of cells in our immune system that produce antibodies for us to fight infections. There are a substantial subset and certain unique types of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma that are of T cell type which are the cells that usually help uh, run and control our immune system and provide long-term immune memory to us. It's a very rare type of lymphomas that are aggressive called NK cell lymphomas, but uh, those are quite rare in this country. So where does a diffuse large B cell fall in the spectrum of non-Hodgkin's lymphomas? It's the most common type of lymphoma all overall. It's uh, just under a third of all lymphomas, um, and uh, it is the classic aggressive lymphoma. Aggressive meaning it would be a relatively faster growing lymphoma, 60 or 70 percent of those cells if you measured their growth rate would be growing when they're tested in the pathologist's uh, testing called KI-67. I see. How do you stage diffuse large B cell lymphoma? Uh, the same way we stage other lymphomas, which is uh, looking at how many lymph node groups and distributed how through the body, so one lymph node group uh, is st defined as stage one. Uh, two or more, but uh, staying on the same half of the body above or below the diaphragm is stage two. Crossing the diaphragm is stage three, so upper and lower halves of the body. And if it's in a non-lymph node area, such as the bone marrow, liver, lung, uh, other organs that aren't lymph nodes, we'll define it as stage four. And there are, in diffuse large B cell lymphomas, a modest number of patients who have it in just one part of the body that is not a lymph node and only there, mm -hmm. such as bone, a vertebrae, for example, or um, a kidney, and it is nowhere else. In that case, we'll call it stage 1E, mm -hmm. one extra nodal. And those can do quite well. I see. We always discuss the, the B symptoms, but please explain to our patients what that means. Sure. B symptoms are sort of flu-like symptoms that people have from the hormones that abnormal white blood cells of the immune system make, and also similar to the same class of cells during the flu. So uh, fever, drenching night sweats, weight loss of 10% are the classic B symptoms. Uh, sort of ones associated with that include fatigue, sometimes itching, mm -hmm. uh, but are a little less specific. I see. Is there ever a time that's appropriate for a patient's family members to seek genetic counseling? Um, most uh, lymphomas do not appear to be strongly hereditable in terms of the risk factor. You will sometimes find family groupings of lymphomas or sometimes it's just a general group, grouping of blood cancers. Mm -hmm. Someone had Hodgkin's, someone had CLL, someone had non-Hodgkin's. Mm -hmm. There really isn't a simply definable genetic risk factor. We just always like to know a patient's family history in terms of predicting their risk, but it's not a strong association as it is in other cancers. Okay, let's say, I know we'll discuss the treatment in a second, but let's say a patient has had an excisional biopsy of a lymph node, mm -hmm. which has come back positive for a diffuse large B cell lymphoma. Mm -hmm. well, what happens next for that patient? Well, that's a critical step to get to, I should remind people. It's fairly common that people have lymph nodes on the neck or in the groin area that are just assessed by a needle biopsy, which is often uh, inadequate to make a diagnosis. So we do recommend if the node is accessible to get a full excision of the lymph node, a surgical piece, a cut actually made to get a big enough piece. And even then, I've just had a patient recently, uh, sometimes you don't get your complete answer. They don't right. quite get enough or the area of tissue is a little bit True. degraded. Mm -hmm. um, but once we've gotten a tissue biopsy either suggestive of or confirmatory of diffuse large B cell lymphoma, we usually start the staging, mm -hmm. which is to do a CAT scan, basically, or PET CT, more preferably, that will look from basically top of the neck to the bottom of the pelvis or upper thigh, uh, neck, chest, abdomen, and pelvis CAT scans with contrast, mm -hmm. preferably with PET scan if it's known already be, to be diffuse large B cell lymphoma. And the reason for that is the CAT scan tells us where the lumps and bumps are and help tell us that this is stage one or stage two or stage three if it's crossing the diaphragm. The PET scan gives us the sort of intensity of activity of growth of those cells um, and occasionally highlights places we didn't suspect were involved with the lymphoma. For example, a regular CAT scan won't tell us about 
other bone lesions. It won't tell us uh, if there are intestinal lesions. They aren't that common in diffuse heart B cell lymphoma, but they're fairly important uh, to not miss. And if they're there, they are followed better by PET scan than they are by plain CT scan in those areas of the body. The PET scan, more importantly, is used to restage after treatment. After someone's initiated treatment, we'd like to see that that PET activity goes all clear. Even if the lumps and bumps are still going down in size, we have better reassurance that the disease itself is dying off or being killed effectively by the chemotherapy. And then finally, there's usually a bone marrow biopsy, everyone's least favorite test, mm -hmm. where we're looking to see if there are lymphoma cells in the bone marrow, which would define it as stage four. And in diffuse large B cell lymphoma, it is very critical to know if it is there in the bone marrow because uh, it is uh, a risk factor in terms of prognosis in the prognostic scoring system. And sometimes in, in clear bone marrow involvement, we'll also recommend a spinal tap or some pre preventative chemotherapy in the spinal fluid. That's what I wanted to ask you next. What is exactly a spinal tap in case patients need to have one? Now, we don't commonly need them in diffuse large B cell lymphoma, but if there is extensive bone marrow involvement, sinus involvement, or HIV status is positive, if someone has background HIV infection, uh, they need to have preventative treatment into the spinal fluid. So it's a small, very skinny needle that's actually inserted between two of the vertebrae at the back of the spine into the little fluid space around the spinal cord to withdraw some fluid. Um, actually, the spinal cord ends a little above that, but they draw out about a, less than a teaspoon of fluid and analyze it for presence of lymphoma cells, and they can inject this very tiny dose of chemo, fairly minimal in terms of any likely symptoms, to rinse through that fluid and try to prevent any lymphoma cells from growing in there. That's only done in those selected cases, okay. not, not commonly needed in diffuse large B cell. But if it's an HIV positive patient, they would do it preventatively because the risk is higher. You mentioned HIV. Are there any other, other risk factors that predispose one to develop diffuse large B cell lymphoma? Well, the common diffuse large B cell lymphoma seem to just occur predominantly spontaneously mm -hmm. in almost all age groups and genders and races and so on. It's a very fairly common cancer. It's the fifth or sixth most common cancer in the United States now. Uh, by incidence, not by cause of death. And uh, yet there are certain unique situations that seem to be pre predisposed to it. Uh, HIV infection or full-blown AIDS is a strong pre predisposing factor. In the era before effective HIV therapy, there was a hundred times increased risk of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Uh, it was very traumatic. And then once heart therapy came along or effective HIV therapy, the risk dropped dramatically, but not entirely to zero. So folks with HIV, even on good medical management, uh, much like patients with lupus and rheumatoid arthritis, there is an increased risk of, of lymphoma, particularly diffuse large B cell. And uh, it is maybe small in absolute numbers, but clearly much higher than the general population. Mm -hmm. There are also patients who have um, certain unique uh, lymphomas related to certain viruses that are have special subtypes and so on, but diffuse large B cell lymphoma also occurs in patients who have had their immune system suppressed, such as for a kidney or heart or lung transplant, which often allows overgrowth of Epstein-Barr virus, which most of us have had in the past or harbor in our body, and it can reactivate and drive the development of a diffuse large B cell lymphoma. In that case, it even has a special name of post-transplant lymphoproliferative exactly. disorder and is uh, sometimes treated about the same as diffuse large B cell, but sometimes a slightly lighter treatment if the immune suppression mm -hmm. can be lightened up. What about uh, diet? Is there anything the patient should do in terms of their diet once they've been diagnosed with cancer, with lymphoma? Um, in this particular lymphoma, there's probably not a special diet that affects the lymphoma per se, either way, uh, but there is some concern if their white counts are very low mm -hmm. while they're on chemotherapy, and not everyone does develop very low white counts during that period when the neutrophils or the bacteria fighting cells are low, We'll often ask patients to follow a neutropenic diet or just simply put to avoid uh, uh, fresh fruits and vegetables that are hard to wash, like mm -hmm. the ones that grow on the ground they are soft, like lettuce and strawberries and so on. Most things that are cooked and fruits and vegetables that can be washed and peeled, like bananas and oranges, are usually fine. <clears throat> How do you prognosticate whether the lymphoma is going to be aggressive or more indolent? What, what is the IPI score? Okay, so the, within diffuse large B cell lymphoma, we have uh, uh, some factors that we look at, some of which are vir virtually all of which are present at diagnosis and uh, have in aggregate some prediction of how people will do. If the first is age greater than 60, uh, stage 3, 4 will do a little worse than stage 1 or 2, 
as one factor only among many. Um, uh, performance status, if someone is very ill with those B symptoms, they're not going to work, they can't exercise, they're not doing their usual activities. Uh, that is a sign of sort of how sick the disease has made them and is influential. If they have an elevated LDH, which is lactate dehydrogenase, uh, it is not LDL, people confuse mm -hmm. it with the one right. from their cholesterol. Uh, that test is often left out on the initial chemistries. It's not part of the standard uh, metabolic panel, mm -hmm. so it has to be added to the lab test. It's not a unique test of lymphoma, but if it's elevated, it is an indicator of more disease or aggressive disease. And if patients have uh, um, multiple sites that are outside of lymph nodes, extranodal sites, that's usually uh, a negative risk factor. But no one factor. Uh, makes it uh, a case that's going to be difficult or impossible to cure. Even people with, you know, four of those factors positive can do quite well, but someone with uh, four factors positive will do about half as well as someone with one factor or right. zero factors. In fact, these days, patients with an IPI score of zero, that are under 60, mm -hmm. stage two, LDH is normal, right. no other extranodal sites, uh, those folks do just about as well as a Hodgkin's patient. They can, they're literally in the 90, 94% cure rate from their standard frontline right. outpatient chemotherapy. Are there any support And groups? we still cure the stage four exactly, patients right. too. That's I do want to point out, and right. many of them with just the regular outpatient chemo. It's not necessarily requiring going on to a transplant or anything. Are there any support groups you recommend to patients before they start treatment? Um, well, it will vary by region and accessibility, but uh, I think the, the best overall organization for patient advocacy is, uh, and there are many subgroups affiliated with them, is the, the Leukemia Lymphoma Society. Mm -hmm. They'll often have local support groups. They sometimes can match a patient up with an individual. Uh, sometimes the patient's own physician can do that and say, well, I have a patient who's, you know, five years out, mm -hmm. she's been in cures, and uh, is happy to talk mm -hmm. to patients who are just getting started on this process. Sometimes that's more accessible or comfortable mm -hmm. for patients than going to a larger uh, support group. Um, and also uh, the uh, Lymphoma Leukemia Society and some of the other affiliates will often arrange for patient-oriented conferences mm -hmm. where I, for example, just did one uh, back in January where we had faculty from all our regional major cancer centers, mm -hmm. UCLA and City of Hope and Cedars and mm -hmm. USC. And we spoke about uh, the individual subtypes of lymphomas and leukemias and sort of little workshop groups mm -hmm. with patients. And LLS, that's one of their main goals. They try to do that in different regions with academic uh, uh, leaders of those, mm -hmm. of those areas to talk about each of those diseases. So patients not only could hear a presentation on what's the latest and greatest in, in treatments or research in this disease, but also get a chance to ask questions about their cases or their concerns. I think what patients want from us the most is and hope. And to meet other patients, exactly. too. And to meet other patients. How do you give your patients hope with diffuse large B cell lymphoma? Well, overall, it's a pretty hopeful disease. It's mm -hmm. one of the greatest successes in cancer medicine. Uh, even before we had some of our best current mm -hmm. treatments, the drug regimen that is the core treatment, CHOP, C -H -O -P, is has been around for 30 or more years and is still sort of the, the rock bed of, of cure in this disease. But we brought it up a notch when rituximab, the monoclonal antibody against CD20, became available. Once it was added to that chemo regimen, the, the cure rates took a fairly big jump upward and uh, has made quite a difference. And you see it, paradoxically, uh, in that it sort of uh, reduced the number of bone marrow transplants that right. we have to do. It, it sort of really dropped the numbers of people who, who needed to go on to that if their disease relapsed, because more of them were cured from the beginning. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for watching. We hope this has been educational for you as well.